the, the morning sessions. Um, quick intro to myself, I'm Sonia Grawl, I'm a VP at PPMA and Chief Operating Officer at Swindon Borough Council. For the first session of this afternoon, I'm delighted to introduce to you Ritika Wadwa. Ritika is the Chief Executive Officer of Prabhav Global. Ritika, apologies if I haven't pronounced that entirely correctly. Um, Ritika is on a mission to bring inclusion and innovation to the heart of organisations and believes cultural intelligence is a capability to do that. So Ritika, welcome and over to you. Thanks so much, Sonia, for the kind introduction. And you did get the names right. Perfect. Thank you. So excited to be here, everyone. I'm going to um, kick off with trying to share my screen first. Um, you're going to see my desktop, hopefully not for that long. There we go. Almost there. Right. Can everyone see the yellow? Yeah. There we go. We're there. Great. Excellent. So I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so um, just introducing the concept of cultural intelligence, which is my expertise. And uh, hopefully we can leave five minutes at the end for questions, which Sonia will very kindly moderate for me. So um, Sonia introduced me briefly, but you know I wanted to throw throw this to the audience really before I go into cultural intelligence is to is to look at that photo. Obviously, guess who that is? Me. Um, and and what is a child capable of when they when they when they are born? Most of the answers I've received is that obviously the world is their oyster; they're capable of everything. But when I was born, um, I was not accepted because of my gender. My grandmother and my extended family was very unhappy that their first grandchild was a was a girl. How how unfortunate! So because I grew up in a very patriarchal system in India, what came in the way of my capability was, was a part of my identity that I had no choice in, which was my gender. I then moved to the UK to do my MBA. And interestingly enough, I heard the term woman of color for the first time in my life in my 20s. And that threw me back a little bit. I was like, uh, what does that even mean? Because of course, in India, I was a woman, I was a girl. And then I, I come to the UK and I become a U U woman of color. color. I'm, um, I'm an immigrant with a funny accent and a funny name. So all these identities that layered on to who I am um, eventually led me to who I am today, which is the CEO and founder of the organization called Prabhav Global. And, and a lot of people ask me, what what has what has come what has been your biggest challenge in your career journey from the time you were born and until today and what i what i say is that my identity those parts of my identity that i did not have a choice on was the biggest obstacles that i faced and um and and the way i see it really is that systems were put in place for someone like me to have a very different experience whether that was growing up in india or living in the uk or or what it's like to show up as a CEO and find founder in an organization today. That was my lived experience. But from a CQ perspective, I have worked across three continents with multinational organizations within the private and the public sector. I sit on the board of British Transport Police. I'm a trustee of the 5% Club and a leadership fellow at Windsor Castle. Now I share all of this my, live, my personal experience and my professional experience with all of you, really because I stand in front of you in all humility to say that you are people professionals doing fabulous jobs in the organizations that you work in. And my expertise sits within cultural intelligence. It's not just what I've learned through being um, chief operating officer for cultural intelligence center. And I've learned from the founders what cultural intelligence really means. I've taken it to the next step, which is I've added my lived experiences, my storytelling, and what that means for someone like me, the journey towards cultural intelligence and the impact of that on someone like me and organizations that hire people like me. What does that really mean? So, so in effect, why my question is, why should you be listening to me? Right up front, we've got about 35, 40 minutes together, and it's time of your precious day. Why should you even be listening to me? Why should you be here today? And the short answer to that is also a question. Do you want to be an effective leader in a diverse, digital, and divided world? 
I'm guessing that all of you are saying, yes, of course, you want to be effective people leaders in a you know, diverse digital and divided world. Because the point is that the world is diverse, great. The point is that the world is divided. The point is that AI is taking over. What does that really mean for leaders in your workplaces? And really, um, I stepped back a little bit and looked at it from an HR professional, people services professionals lens. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the most important charge of a people leader is to unlock the potential of their people. Yes. And if that's the case, then your your effectiveness as a leader in the diversity and the division and, and the digitalization of the world we are in, how will you tap on that human potential to bring the best experience out for the people that work with you, for you, within your organizations? And hopefully that's established why you should be listening to me in the next 35, 40 minutes. Um, so what I'm going to take you through in this time is really what is, just step back a little bit and get into understanding of what is culture, then what is cultural intelligence, why it is needed, although we've established how important it is to be an effective leader, really, what are the outcomes? What is the ROI of investing in another development tool out there? And how can you become culturally intelligent? And I'm not going to leave you with just that. There's going to be a call to action accountability here. So, so that's what I'm going to cover in, in my time with you. Feel free to please um, uh, ask your questions, although Sonia will monitor them for me so I can just concentrate on delivering the presentation to you. Question, how was common cold cured in your house when you were growing up? Feel free to reply, put it in the chat. We've got lemon and ginger, lemon yeah. zip, paracetamol and Vicks, Vicks vapor rub. Oh, I love the smell of Vicks vapor rub. Um, just got <laughs> on, <laughs> just got on with it. Yeah, Turmeric and ginger is a popular one. Anyone's come in with rum, whiskey or brandy yet? <laughs> no, none of those. Not yet. It's being nice and not revealing. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, so, yes, brandy. There you go. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's got to be one. Has oh, to be. hot toddy. Yeah, yeah. Judy, Judy, Judy was killed with a hot toddy. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those answers. And, you know, I've been in lots of rooms asking this question and I've got all sorts of replies from, you know, run, rubbing onions on your feet to, yes, of course, just get on with it because that builds your immunity. Um, I ask this question because it's a very simple question to get to the point that what is acceptable and familiar to me might not be acceptable and familiar to someone else, but that doesn't make it wrong. So if someone's our cultural upbringing meant that we had ginger or brandy or nothing or lemsip or whatever it was, the way we were brought up has an influence in the way we show up at le as leaders at work. But again, what is familiar is to us is not necessarily familiar to someone else, but that does not make it wrong. So I like I would like you and urge you from this small exercise to hold on to the words of acceptable and familiar because I'm going to be using that um, during my conversation with you. So what is culture really? Culture is everything that we are. My culture is that I'm a woman, that you know I'm a Hindu, uh, I'm a mother. It's, it's, it's ideas, customs, social behavior of a particular people in society. So when within the cultural intelligence work, the first question I get is does cultural intelligence mean it helps me work does uh, you know helps me work better with an Indian or helps me work better with someone who's British? Yes, nationality does play a part in it, but that's a small part because culture is everything that we are. It's the way we do things around here. Culture is all of our identities, your cultural wiring, which is your education, where you were brought up, what's your nationality, what customs you follow, where you lived, your background, personal interest, so many parts of our cultural wiring that make us who we are. And research shows that how we lead is influenced by who we are. And that is who we are. All of that is our cultural, our culture, our cultural wiring. Then there's organizational culture. 
Yes, so organizational culture, I share the story of the two fish swimming in the ocean. Two little young fish are swimming away happily when an older fish comes along and asks them, hey boys, how's the water today? The young fish looks at his or her friend and goes, um, what the hell is water? That's organizational culture. It's in us, it's around us. We are so immersed in it. We are so much a part of it that sometimes we don't even realize that we are in it. Organizational culture could be when you walk into the IT department, what does that feel like? When you walk into the HR, HR department, you can feel the why. It's different. But can you name it? Not necessarily, but that is the culture. That underlying current, that water that surrounds us, that's the organizational culture. Then there's generational culture. I mean, I've worked in public sector um, across councils, and then I do a lot of work with the fire services. This morning, actually, I was at the at Sandhurst with the British Army and listening to the conversations and the conference and activities they had there. And I could just see the impact of generations and the culture that we bring because of the generation we were brought up in, into that mix. And it is so important to understand those differences that we bring because of the generational culture, because with that, there can be biases. So-and-so can't get their head around tech. So-and-so is really lazy because they are a millennial. All those biases that come to the fore because of the age and the culture, the generational culture. So there is all those cultures um, that is that is that forms culture, culture identity, organizational culture, generational culture, etc. So culture really matters. It's really important to understand why it's important for us to understand who we are from our cultural identity perspective, who our team is from their cultural identity perspective. But when it really matters is when you get the get the same email the fifth time from the same person asking you the same question because they haven't understood what you're trying to ask them to do. When stress hits in organizations and you've got deadlines, when things are not going to plan, that's when culture culture matters because if you haven't understood what's going on because of personalities or because of cultural identities or because of whatever aspects of culture that we bring as leaders to our workplace, then mutual distrust starts, come, starts seeping in. Language and communication barriers. If, if, if an interview, um, and this is a very common example that I give, that when you sit across the table interviewing a candidate who does not look you in the eye when they ask, when they are answering the questions, a lot of the time, the immediate impulse is to think they're rude. But maybe they're being respectful to you because that's how their culture is. So language, verbal and non-verbal communication barriers, the assumptions that we make about people because it is not familiar to us. Confronting conflict. So what cultural intelligence and, and, and the work around culture does is take away the, the relationship conflict and get you down to the task conflict. And uh, psychological well-being, of course, that is related to how we feel and how we show up in all our identities at work. You would have heard of IQ. Uh, uh, most people would have heard of EQ. CQ is the new kid on the block. And it's the intersection of these three forms of intelligences that make us thrive in any diverse environment. So what that really means is that IQ is not malleable. It's what we are born with. But EQ and CQ, we can develop. We can absolutely develop our cultural intelligence and we can develop our emotional intelligence. And the difference between cultural intelligence um, and cultural awareness, cultural competency, et cetera, is it's, it's a form of intelligence. There is a, there's a way to measure it. There's a way to develop it. And, it, it, and as, as I go through it, you will understand further why this is a form of intelligence and why it's important for us to develop it. The research basis um, of cultural intelligence is that it has been around for 20 plus years uh, across 148 countries and empirical research data, peer reviewed studies have been done on the work of cultural intelligence. It was founded by the people that I work with within the Cultural Intelligence Center 20 years ago. And so I feel very honored to have learned from the best around the capability 
of cultural intelligence, why it was um, research founded and the practical applications around the world. So anyone in there uh, on the call that loves research data, please feel free to reach out and I'm happy to share that information around statistics. So what is cultural intelligence? Cultural intelligence then is the capability to function and relate effectively in culturally diverse situations. And this is why I've gone through what does culture mean? Because culturally diverse situations mean being able to work with people that are different from us. Capability, a skill that we can develop and relate. Relationship. Unless we work in a role that we do not have to interact with any other human beings, which will absolutely not be the case for anyone on this call, we need cultural intelligence to be effective, successful leaders and show up in a way that we are able to tap into the best of the human potential. What does not guarantee cultural intelligence? High emotional intelligence. So leaders would say, well, I'm, I'm highly emotionally intelligent. Surely I can be effective. Not really, because um, I would give an example of when someone is speaking louder than what is acceptable and familiar to you. Is the immediate immediate um, response to judge them or to think that they're being rude or they're being loud for whatever reason. Emotional intelligence takes you this far in able to being aware of your emotions and those around you, but CQ takes off from where EQ leaves us. In a nutshell, you must be really good um, in, in whatever job that you do, technically competent, whether that's in HR, whether that's in IT, whether that's in finance, that does not guarantee high cultural intelligence. Intercultural effectiveness does not guarantee high cultural intelligence because intercultural courses will, will show you or talk to you or explore further. How would you work better when you go to India with Indians or how would you work better with Chinese? Whereas the cultural intelligence framework is able to help you work and relate effectively in any culturally diverse situation. International travel. This is the most common one. I've traveled the world. Well, I myself have lived in three continents and traveled the world before I found cultural intelligence. So I just thought, of course, my cultural intelligence is off the roof. Not really, because how many people do we know who get on a bus, the tourist bus, when they come to a new country, see the five or 10 sites, get back on the bus and go home? My own relatives from India, you know, I, I can share that openly to say they'll come to London, they'll stay in the same hotel take a taxi and go to Westfield Mall, do their shopping there, come back and eat in the same Indian restaurant every night and take the flight back. So international travel does not guarantee cultural intelligence. It's what you do and how you experience and reflect in situations that are not familiar to you is what guarantees cultural intelligence. So what are the cultural intelligence capabilities? Capabilities, skills that you can all develop. CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and CQ action. I'm going to take you through um, each of them. And the first one would be CQ drive. This really, to me, is, this one is one of my favorite capabilities because it, it gets you back to questioning the why your motivation to want to work with people that are different from you. That needs to be there before we even go. So when we go into rooms where we're trying to have conversations about why diversity needs to be top of the agenda, or actually there is diversity, why does inclusion now need to be on the top of the agenda? I think unpacking the why this is important for you as a team and an organization is, is the core of success. Or actually use that model for any challenge you have. Let's sit back a second. What is the problem? Why are you trying to resolve it? The why? What is your why? Why did you wake up in the morning and go to work? Why are you attending this session? The why? This is the CQ drive. And it's not just the why. It's also your ability to persist when things don't go to plan, when frustrations happen. So if you're traveling to a country where you've had enough of having different food, you're not feeling too well, it's your ability to want to continue persisting and being patient with those situations that are not familiar to you. And that's your drive. Question, 
Identify one cultural group that's very difficult for you and ask yourself why. At this point, normally, if we, we were we were sat in a room together, or if it was comfortable, I'd be more than uh, I would more than welcome people sharing that. But really, this is more of a reflection at this point for you because what I'm urging you to do is really become self aware. This is the these are the particular cultural groups that I find difficult to work with, and this is why I find it difficult to work with. But I've gotten up and come to work because this is my motivation. This is my purpose. So how am I going to circumvent or navigate the cultural group that I find difficult to work with? Is it my biases? Is it a conversation I need to have? This is what CQ drive, but it's very basic, will urge you to do. To really reflect and become a little bit more self-aware of your why and what's coming in the way of you achieving that why. Seek your knowledge then. It's your understanding of how cultures are similar and different. So this is where typically your policies and procedures would sit. This is where you would read books. This is where you would attend trainings, whether that's unconscious bias or any other, any other thing that furthers your knowledge and learning about how cultures are similar and different. And that's where CQ knowledge sits. Um, within the cultural intelligence work, CQ knowledge goes one step further and it's a, it's a collation of 10 cultural values that have been put together based on work done by Hofstetter, Trompenas, Edward T. Hall. And these 10 cultural values are really your preferences. And this is really the fun part of cultural intelligence, because what it does is that you you typically you would take an assessment to find out your CQ scores within those four capabilities. But what it also does, it shows you on the spectrum of low and high power distance. Are you a low power distance or a high power distance person? So, for example, I work with somebody who is um, who is the chief people officer within an within an NHS trust, and she said, "I've done so many different trainings over over the years as I grew up the ranks, and this was the first training that actually put language to how I was brought up and the nuances to my specific cultural upbringing." What that meant was, she said, "I grew up in an extremely high power distance household," and what that meant was I was hiring people that were very similar to me. And the second there was somebody in the team that wasn't similar to who I was, i.e. low power distance, they don't believe in hierarchy, they just want to get on with doing their work, that's when the conflict started happening. So how is it that we unpack who we are and who we are within the team? And once you've understood exactly where you sit on the spectrum of each of these cultural values, your team members understand that as well. And one of the activities I do in the workshop is get the cultural values map out and you actually plot yourselves. And I did this on Monday, a team of six, seven, at the same time, plotting exactly where they sit on those cultural values with very specific strategies on how to work with people that are different from us. So, for example, if Sonia is a direct communicator and Grace is an indirect communicator, now we know that about each other rather than sitting there and thinking, well, Sonia is just really rude and aggressive and just too, to the point in my face or Grace going, oh, my God, why can't she just get to the point? You know, like it's just it's taking away the guesswork from people uh, that work closely together by understanding really why are they showing up late for meetings? Why is it that when I give them instruct instructions five times, it still doesn't get done? Is it because they are high context? Is it because they are high uncertainty avoidance? As in, I, I don't want to take the risk, so I don't want to make the decision. But we're not understanding that about each other. And so within the CQ knowledge box, what's happening is you are collecting knowledge about yourself as a leader. How do you show up? What's your preference? Because what's cultural values don't change. That's a preference. It's not a right and it's not a wrong. CQ capabilities, you can change. And by building the knowledge, what you're doing is you're just, again, taking out the relationship conflict and getting down to the task conflict. 
From the direct indirect example, you have an urgent deadline at work tomorrow, but a personal emergency comes up and you have to ask for the day off. Will you be direct or indirect? Now, I've had other questions to this to say, well, it's situational, it depends on the relationship with the boss, it depends on what else is going on. Let's take all the, it depends out. What it means is that when you look at these cultural values, what is your natural style? What is it that you're most comfortable with? Are you a direct communicator by, by nature or by nature, actually, you, 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 know, you prefer not to spell things out? So I would love for those answers to come into the chat, but equally, um, it's up to you to reflect on that. CQ strategy then, this is the fun part. So it's all well and good knowing your why. It's all well and good knowing the what. So this is how I work. This is how my team work. I've gathered all the knowledge. CQ strategy in action is the accountable behavior part. This is where you're using your why and your what to plan for interactions that are different or unfamiliar to you. And when that plan is not going to plan, a culturally intelligent leader is able to flex and adapt and get the outcome that they prefer from that. So... At this point, I give an example of couch to 5K. We decide we want to do a couch to 5K. The why? You want to do it because you want to get healthy, because of mental well-being, because of losing weight, whatever the reason be. That's your why. If that why is missing, you're not going to be able to get off the couch. So that's your CQ drive. CQ knowledge then. What sort of shoes do I need? Is there any running clubs in the area? Can I ask a buddy to run with me? How, you know, is can I run the 10K? Am I going to be able to do the marathon? Whatever it is at this point is knowledge gathering, the information that you need to be able to do the couch to 5K. Strategy then, the planning. Okay, well, the, the, the running group runs at 7 p.m. If I have to run at 7 p.m., I'm going to need the childcare or actually knowing myself and being self-aware, I know that I might give, give up halfway. So am I going to make sure that I have a buddy to support me and keep me accountable to that? That's the planning. And also the planning, the strategy is when things are not going to plan, you're able to adapt and flex for the outcome you want. And CQ action, of course, is the is the actual doing part. But before we get to, oh, sorry, <laughs> before we get to that, I'm going to show you a photo, which you did see quickly, but I would like you to clock your first thought when you see that picture. Feel free to put it in the chat. I want to see these answers. <laughs> You've got poor driver out of the box line. Right. Um, yeah. Irresponsible. Because there's special awareness, not good. Someone was in a rush in a rush, selfish parking, because they can. Okay. Right, all sorts of answers. Well, I'm, I'm used to those, and that's typically what we get. But here's what a culturally intelligent leader, this is how they use their CQ strategy. When you are faced with a situation that A, frustrates you or is not familiar to you, you hold your judgment and you come from a place of curiosity. So... In this case, there could be snow on the ground and they couldn't see the lines. There could be a hospital in the background there and they wouldn't rush to get their child to the hospital. Or actually, all the other cars were parked like that and they had no other choice and the cars have left now. And so this one's left alone being judged for the wrong parking. So when we are faced with a colleague who shows up consistently late at work or want to talk about their weekend more than what's familiar to us or comfortable with us because we need to get on with doing the job. Can we step back? Can we step back and ask ourselves why in the situations that frustrates us, in the situations that cause us stress, in the situations where we, we naturally forms assumptions, behaviors, uh, assumptions and biases towards wh why what's happening in front of us? So that's CQ strategy in a nutshell.
So CQ action is the doing part, your ability to adapt when relating and working in multicultural. It is the, it is the ability that actually gets you to get up and do the couch to 5K, the ability to adapt. And, and when we say to adapt, there, there are certain things we need to bear in mind, the doing part is that we need to understand whether it's a tight culture. So how much do we need to adapt or not? How much should we be adapting or not? How much leeway do we have? So if you walk into a into an organizational culture or a department where actually this is the way, absolutely the way they do things, maybe you don't have that much of a leeway. It's understanding the culture around you, doing a 360 of that to understand how much of it do I need to adapt? I have the capability to adapt or not. Then asking yourself, really, will adapting compromise my mission? So going back to the CQ drive, what is it you want to achieve as an individual, as an organization? The number of suppliers and organizations that work with to say, well, actually, when you're traveling to different countries, we, we are not going to adapt because it's going to compromise our mission. Or actually, what is happening around the world with wearing the hijab? What does that mean for Muslim women? That, you know, like if, if you want a job in France, you can't wear a hijab. What's the choice? Am I going to adapt? Am I not? That's the choice there. Um, and also will retaining the differences make us stronger as a team, as an organization? So how much should I really adapt or how much should I show up and allow the space for my team to show up in the way they are? Because retaining those differences, bringing those unique perspectives to the table is really what makes us stronger and that's the CQ action. And, and my example of CQ action is that when I decided to form my organization, Prabhav Global, the easy way to go was to use the word, to say impactful leadership limited, for example. But I, I wanted to retain my identity. I called it Prabhav. It's not an easy word, but what it means is impact in Hindi. That's me. This is me. This is why I want to do this work. I don't, I want to use the cultural intelligence model and framework for impactful leadership, to be able to hold leaders accountable for positive behavior change and actions. So actually, you know what? I'm going to show up as my full self, my absolute authentic self to this work. And that means starting from the start. The yellow is because it's my favorite color, because it's the color of turmeric. It's the color that transforms and heals from within. So everything that came supernaturally to me is what I'm bringing to this work. And that was the question I asked myself. Do I adapt or not? And I decided not. That's CQ action in action. So everyone can develop CQ. That's the good news. For CQ drive, you motivate yourself. CQ knowledge, you learn about cultures you interact with most. Um, CQ strategy, anticipate and adjust your interactions. And CQ action is, of course, adapt as needed. Now, um, I have mentioned this before, but there is a CQ assessment that, uh, that I offer through my organization, which has been developed by the CQ Center and again, peer reviewed research for 20 plus years across organizations. And, um, and the good news is BART's NHS was one of the, one of the biggest clients, is one of the biggest clients for cultural intelligence in the UK. Only yesterday, they won the award at HPMA for the, for the learning and development, within the learning and development category. So cultural intelligence work that the NHS BARTS has rolled out has actually won the award because you can see what that's doing to that organization from an individual team and organizational level. But why, so why do you need CQ? I, I said up front that to be an effective leader, you need to develop cultural intelligence. But what is the ROI of cultural intelligence? Because I have been asked this question, you know, there's so many tools out there. Why do I need to invest in another learning and development tool? Well, here's why, because A, so far, I hope I've established to some degree, even with the short time that we've had together, that it takes away the relationship conflict so that you are left with the task conflict. Because as people professionals, you have to tap into the human, human potential. And how are you going to do that if there are misunderstandings and conflict based on someone not looking you in the eye or not shaking your hand or speaking too loudly or doing things in a way that is not familiar to you. So what CQ does is, is reduce it. And this is research based. This is not me saying it. This is all research based across the 20 years to say that it reduces conflict and misunderstanding. It increases trust, trust cooperation and in negotiation effectiveness. 
which leads to inclusion and innovation because really innovation sits at the heart of being able to show up as we are, being able to trust each other as a team, to cooperate and work collaboratively. And, um, and really that for organizations, whether you're a heart-led leader or a head-led leader, this is the answer. As a heart-led leader, it's the right thing to do to be more inclusive. As a head-led leader and also everyone that has deadlines and, um, uh, and targets, as an organization, it leads to more profitability and cost savings. In your case, as, as people professionals, it does lead to higher retention. That is proven. The CQ touch points start from the individual, the CQ drive, your why, moves on to the team level, understanding each other's cultural values. How can we work more collaboratively together? What is the team cultural intelligence and how can we build that? What does the organization look like? And ultimately, the touch points are your community, your client, your stakeholders, your suppliers, because if you are not showing up as a culturally intelligent leader to your community, your stakeholders, your suppliers, then someone else will. One of the biggest challenges I got from a, from a local council was to ask, um, why are young professionals not applying to our organization? You won't do it. Somebody else will. And so... Again, back to the effective leader. Six traits of an inclusive leader. This is not me. This is Deloitte study, study that says the six C's of an inclusive leader are curiosity, cognizance, courage, commitment, collaboration, and cultural intelligence. I would go so far as to say if you're culturally intelligent, you will be curious because you come from a place of curiosity rather than judgment. CQ strategy cognizant you will be more cognizant you will be more courageous because you're able to have those brave conversations in safe spaces you are more committed because you've understood your drive your motivation your purpose why you do what you do so you are more committed and you are more collaborative that's by default because of the cq knowledge part you've understood each other at the human level this is one of my favorite quotes People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. And in this quote really is the heart again of what cultural intelligence is, the ability to communicate with humans without fearing. And um, there's something I heard earlier this week that I wanted to share specific to this conference and the people on the call here that really hit, a, hit, a, hit the nail on the head as far as the cultural intelligence work goes is unless we optimize human experience, we fail to optimize human performance. I hope that makes sense. If we don't optimize the human experience, who we are, what we want to bring to the table, and we don't allow your, allow ourselves or those around us to do that, how are we going to optimize human performance? And another thing I want to leave um, people leaders in this space with is, uh, is, is this paragraph I read somewhere recently. And I, again, it's stuck a chord specific for this conference is to say, a great team culture is built upon the core people management and development fundamentals that exist within an organization. So you are the custodians of that. In effect, you are the custodians of your organization's culture. So what are you going to do about that? Yeah, big words, lots of responsibility, but there, there we go, we can break it down. <laughs> So becoming culturally intelligent, the first step is experience and reflection. Put yourself in situations that are not familiar, what is not easily acceptable for you. The common cold, put yourself in situations that are not familiar because there is no uh, substitute for experience. And then when you've had that experience where you've spoken with somebody and they've said stuff that doesn't sit, within, that doesn't sit comfortably with you, reflect, why is that? What was it about that that hit a chord on me, with me? And I need to understand what's going on with that. So the first step would be experience and reflection. There's a CQ assessment and cultural values profile that you can get to see exactly where you sit with your current cultural intelligence and your cultural values. Um, I do one-to-one -one executive leadership training and I run workshops, two-hour bite-sized workshops over a period of time because this is a journey. 
You can't wake up in the morning and decide I want to be culturally intelligent and it happens the next day. We're all on a journey. And if you're committed to becoming a culturally intelligent individual because of the reasons I cited very early on in this discussion, then this is what we need to do. Call to action, I said. I said that I will be giving you that. So here we go. Three things. Identify some of your own cultural identities first and then try to identify identities of those within your team. How psychologically safe do you think they feel to reveal who they really are? Which parts of your identity are you comfortable to reveal when at work? And if you're not, why not? Bit of self-reflection there. After you've done the self-reflection, kindly go and have lunch with someone very different from your team and do not talk about work. Get to know that human potential behind the human, the human experience. And always, always start from a place of curiosity. The next time you get an email that frustrates you and makes you really upset, sit back for a second and reflect on why this person might be using those specific words or saying what they are saying. Come from a place of curiosity rather than judgment. And that's that. Questions? Vichika, thank you for an absolutely thought-provoking introduction um, to the, the, your breadth of experience and wealth of knowledge around cultural intelligence. So much for us to go away with there. Your real reflections around curiosity, holding curiosity and the importance for us as professionals and the roles that we have and for really starting us on this journey so you, you, you finish the session with a call to action and an invitation for questions does anybody have any questions for Ritika we have some lovely comments amazing presentation very inspirational such a good session and I, I absolutely echo all of those that's really the tip of the iceberg. Normally, this all of this happens in six hours at least, right? And all the experience and self-reflection. But I've tried to go through it in, in, a, in a quick 40 minutes. There's a lot of, you know, verbal, non-verbal um, role play activities, a lot of time, more time for reflection, uh, especially around identifying your own cultural identities, etc. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that PPMA is having me back in April for an in-person workshop. So I hope to notch it up. And I hope to see all of you there. And I'm Hi, sure Pam. you will. You've got lots of hands shaking. Sorry, I think, Pam, have you got a question? Pam, we can't hear you. I can see your lips moving, but we can't hear you. Still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Drop it in the chat and I'll read it out. Trish is asking, what's the biggest challenge you find when working with organisations in this area? So, the two, so if I can notch that back to the cultural intelligence framework, it's really the drive and the action. So a lot of organizations will start with, oh, yeah, well, attend another training or here we go again about the DEI agenda. It's not about that. So unpacking the drive is what I find is the key to really moving forward in any of this work around, especially when it involves humans and people. And then it's the action because, you know, a lot of a lot of conversations happen, trainings happen. Uh, you know, ev all the ticks in the boxes happen, but then actually the action part, the actual doing part, moving on from the planning, what can organizations do to show up as inclusive, effective leaders? That's the challenge I find across sectors. So um, so either it's the drive or the action. The knowledge is re rarely the missing key. That's great. Thank you. I think Pam is still um, eagerly typing away, but, but thank you for leaving us with a lot to think about. And also for, I suppose, the curiosity that we're going to sit with until we hopefully see you again. Well, some of us will see you again um, next year. Um, Pam, as soon as your question comes up, we will read it out. But for now, I'm going to hand over to our president, Gordon, who is going to end today's session and leave us with some further